often this is described as one of the pinnacles of Revelation, uh, the book of Ephesians uh, itself. So we really are coming up to the heights. Uh, I think probably one of the reasons uh, people say that is because even in the very first chapter, mentions how God has blessed us in the heavenly places in Christ. So we're really going up where the air is thin, <laughs> evidently here. Uh, so so uh, prepare yourself for that. We'll read down into chapter 14. So Ephesians 3, verse uh, 14, down into chapter 4, sorry. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Paul writes to the church in Rome and he tells them says to them in one of these chapters, I magnify my ministry. He's ministering to the Gentiles, and the reason he, he magnifies his ministry to the Gentiles is because it's, it's intended to make the Jews, who he's very burdened for, jealous. And so it seems to be his reasoning there is, I, I magnify my ministry. What I want to do for us uh, today is to magnify the ministry of the church. Uh, magnify the ministry of the church for us. There are many good things about the church. Um, you know, there are social aspects that we all enjoy. You hear a sermon that helps you deal with moral failures or moral concerns in your life that encourages you and exhorts you. 
you find friends um, of other people, you intermingle and mix with other people, you have encouragement for your children. All of these are some of the benefits of the church that many social scientists would say bring good outcomes for people. Uh, you get to sing, you get to pray, you get to hear the ministry of the word. Um, but many of those things are actually not the things that we're going to be considering today as far as what really, what would really glorify or magnify the ministry of the church. On our way down here, we were, we were driving and, you know, some of these roads, back roads, you go, you just have these little, little lifts in the road and the kids enjoy that. My wife seems to enjoy that. <laughs> um, and it reminded my children of uh, going on, uh, going to an amusement park on maybe like a roller coaster. It reminded me of when I went with my daughter, one of the older roller coasters, my six-year-old uh, daughter. She, I was trying to encourage her. She was just tall enough to go on this, and it, you know, goes loops and uh, really fast. But I enjoyed it as a kid, and I thought, oh, maybe she's up to this, and so. She got on with me, and we were sitting there, a little bit anxious, but fine. And uh, it's very short. I mean, I mean, you're off, and you hardly know it, and it's about 45 seconds later, and you're done. And uh, she seemed a bit nervous during the ride, but then at the very end, I was like, oh, how did you like it, Mary? And she's like, I think I'm going to be sick. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, oh, no, I hope I didn't ruin her. Like, this is not, she's not going to like this. She's like, can we go again? <laughs> right? Like, these, these are the two things that would really, really make an amusement park interesting for a child. It'll make you feel unwell, and, and you could possibly go again, right? These kinds of, well, we want to magnify the ministry of the church. Uh, we, we really want it to become glorious in, in our eyes today. Um, and, and the, way that, the way that we want to begin with is by thinking about this prayer that we just read. Uh, it's interesting that Paul includes these prayers. This is what I pray for you. I bow my knees. And, and here is, he tells us exactly what he wants to, to pray for us. Uh, one of the problems that we have is that we have a very small concept of God, kind of a postcard concept of God is often is often all that we have. Uh, this prayer is a prayer unlike many of the prayers that you or I might pray. Um, the, the requests are all spiritual requests, aren't they? And there's nothing wrong with physical requests. Give us today our daily bread. The Lord taught us to pray those th kinds of things. Um, but, but this prayer is for us spiritually. Um, um, it appeals to God for what all of us desperately need. Uh, we are often too weak. Um, like a person recovering in hospital, and they cannot, they cannot manage the kind of food that most of the time we would eat, or like a little baby uh, who, you know, you, when you feed little babies as they, as they get older, the first thing you start out with like, is like a rice paste. Right, and you just kind of feed this spoon, feed this to them, and, and half of it comes comes back out. But it's a very, very simple food, isn't it? Um, and, and often, and often, that's the kind of diet that that almost we need. Um, but but the Lord wants to improve our diet, our understanding of Himself, uh, not to be so weak and immature, and without the capacity uh, to understand. Um, but that's how it is with babies and, and people who are unwell, who are ill. They, they, they cannot eat and digest or profit from some of the delights, delightful food that we eat, things like, you know, cheesecake or pork or salmon or, you know, grease that, that's on chips. You know, it's just difficult for a system to manage those kinds of things. Well, what can be done to overcome this frailty in our spirits so that we can come to appreciate the richness of what God intends for us? So that, sorry, so that when we, so that when we read a passage like Ephesians 1, we, we can take some of that in. I mean, doesn't this happen to you often? You read some of these and they're, and they're so dense. 
that, that your mind just goes over it and you, and you just kind of, you miss really precious things uh, that, that the Lord puts there for, for you. Um, well, this is a prayer for strength. He prays, I'm going to, I'll give you the three points. Um, uh, he prays that we would be strengthened for inner uh, renovation. St- secondly, strengthened for comprehension. Sorry, comprehension. And then strengthened for manifesting Christ's character. All right, don't worry, I'll give those to you again. Uh, so, s- first of all, strengthened by or for inner renovation. If you look at the requests, um, I'm not going to go into some of the detail, the 14 and 15, but verse 15, here's his request, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So, So it is spirit strengthening that he's requesting here, requesting that the Spirit would strengthen us. But this is the concept that I want us to think about briefly, is this idea of strengthening. What what do we mean by strengthening, right? Because you, when you think of strength or power, and we have a lot of terminology for power in, in uh, in the book of Ephesians in general, and you may, you know, I'm not sure what you think of, maybe you think of, like me, you think of, oh, SpaceX, this starship rocket, and all the million whatever they measured in thrust <laughs> that this rocket has in order to, to lift off and move itself up into space. Well, well th- that's one way. Or I, I remember being in the States and uh, being on a, on a train journey, which is very unusual, but I, I was on one in a, in a town where my parents live. And we went by this, this other train that, I mean, I think we were counting, there's like 115 cars, and they're all loaded with, you know, all kinds of coal or other resources. Uh, and just to think of the power that would be required to pull a train like that. So, so that, that's one way to think about power. But, but maybe another way to think about power would be, so you take a tin, right? And how are you going to get into that tin? Now, it's pretty easy if you have a can opener, isn't it? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's not one with a pull tab on the top, right? So, so you have this tin, and and for many of us, you know, we really wouldn't know how to get into it without without a tin opener. Um, and so, in some ways, you know, it's it's pretty easy to use a tin opener, and you don't have to exert a lot of force to do that. But that's a pretty powerful tool, isn't it? I mean, it'd be very difficult to get into that tin if you didn't if you didn't have a tin opener, unless you unless you have a uh, power steering would be another thing where. You know, we take power steering for granted. Uh, those of us who drive, we just hardly think of it at all. But if you've ever tried to steer a car without power steering, maybe I'm going back a ways, but, um, you, you know, the next day you're like, why, why am I so sore, right? Uh, it can be, can be very difficult. So, so there are different ways that you might think about power. When I, when I was uh, in high school, I worked with my grandfather, and we, would, uh, we did cement work where we were moving like a driveway. So if you have an old cement driveway, we would go in there and break it out. We didn't we didn't use like a bobcat or any heavy artillery. We just we just use a sledgehammer essentially and a bar. Um, well, if you went over to that slab and you and you you want to lift it a little bit so that you can hit it with a sledgehammer so that it'll just crack if it's just on the ground, it just kind of pulverizes it. Well, if you went over there and tried to lift it up, like stick your hands under there and lift it, it'd be vi- you know just can't do that. However. Uh, if you get a little a little piece of rock and put it there in front, you have a, like a six or eight foot bar. You stick it under there, and and even you know one of the small one of our my smaller cousins who worked with us could just you know press on that and and lift the whole slab up, and then you could right. There there are different ways to think about power, and and you're not even thinking about this is really this is really strong, right? When you're thinking about using a tin opener or or using a bar like a lever. But, but those are powerful ways of working. And, and often it's so powerful, you don't, even, you don't even really reflect on it. You don't, don't, you don't think twice about it. And I think that would be, that's kind of a helpful way to think about the, the work of the Spirit, that sometimes it just doesn't seem like a big deal at all, but it's, it's immensely powerful. Another concept that you would want to think about is if someone is poorly and they're weak, 
and to be strengthened with health. Not, not that someone becomes super muscular or anything like that, but just coming to a healthy state. We would refer to that as being strengthened. Uh, and, and that's another concept that I think all of those things would be something that we might want to bear in mind as we consider this together. Well, it is the Spirit's strengthening. Well, the Spirit, remember, takes a person who suppresses the knowledge of God and turns them into someone who worships God. The, the Spirit is one who, right, it's like the wind, where the wind blows wherever it wills. And you, you, know, you don't know where it comes from, but you see the effects of it, and the effects of it are dramatic in regeneration. I, it's like, you know, if you think about the wind, I mean, here I am, my front garden, dandelions in the front garden. How do they get there, right? I mean, we pull them all out, and none of my neighbors seem to have dandelions. How, well, the wind, the wind moves. How, how do you explain that, that the Lord work in your heart? Now here you are, all your neighbors just rejecting, not, not even interested, no interest at all. But, but the Spirit blows where He wills, and He works in the hearts, uh, in our hearts, in a, in a transforming way. And, and to you and I, it just, it's, it's like, well, we hardly can reflect on what it was like before that. We, we hardly notice, but, but this is powerful working, the work of the Spirit. It is invisible strengthening. It takes place in your inner man, in your inner person. Um, most of the time, the way that this is explained is it's kind of like with David. And you remember Samuel comes to anoint and he goes through all the, all the sons of Jesse and he sees this Eliab and he's a tall and strong young lad and he's like, oh, surely this is the one. The Lord says, no. Man looks on the outward appearance, but, but the Lord looks on the heart. This is the part of you that this is dealing with. It's not, it's not so much your external. It's, it's that, that hidden person of the heart. The outer man, right? The outer man is fading away, but the, but the inner man can be renewed day by day, we're told. All right, so it is invisible strengthening but this is, where, this is where I really need you to, to follow me. Verse 17, some of the translations use the word so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. But, but I think it's probably helpful to think about these two things as being very similar, that the Spirit strengthening within you is like Christ dwelling in your heart, that, that, that he's actually kind of renaming the concept there. One of the examples that I would give of this is, is in Ephesians 5, 18, 17, 18. It talks about how be, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And there are going to be certain results from this, right? That you will be speaking to one another in psalms and hymns. You'll be singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You, you'll be giving thanks. You'll be submitting to one another, right? Th those concepts. Colossians 3 refers to giving the word of Christ a rich dwelling in your heart. Okay, so, so, so in Ephesians, it says, right, don't be drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. Colossians, it talks about us giving the word of Christ a rich dwelling, and, and the results are pretty much the same. Now, you, you find some of the same results there in Colossians that you do have. So, 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 so often there is this overlap between these two concepts, it's that Christ dwelling in your heart. So it is Christ's indwelling. The idea of dwelling is that he makes, he makes your heart his home. So, so, so he's not sojourning there. It's not like just stopping over, but, but he comes and makes, makes your heart his home. Paul prays that, that you be strengthened in your inner person, right, by the Spirit, that Christ would dwell in your heart by faith. John 14, verse 22, one of the disciples says to, to the Lord Jesus, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answers him, if, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. 
the concepts that are being communicated there are that if, right, if you love him, if you keep his word, then his father will love you. They will come to you and make, your, make their home with you. I think another way to helpfully think about this, uh, there's a social commentator, uh, and he, uh, the social commentator has said, many of us have a, a mania for home improvement or DIY. The most common motive for DIYing was that of putting a personal stamp on the place. Right? This is clearly understood as an unwritten rule of home ownership and a central element of the moving in ritual, often involving the destruction of any evidence of the previous owner's territorial marking. As one man said, you've got to rip something out when you move in. Watch almost any residential street in the UK over a period of time and you will notice that shortly after a for sale sign comes down, a skip appears to be filled with often perfectly serviceable bits of ripped out kitchen or bathroom along with ripped out carpets, cupboards, fireplace surrounds, shelves, tiles, banisters, doors, and even walls and ceilings. Even if you can't rip anything out, you've got to do something. A house that has not been tinkered with will barely qualify as a home. <laughs> All right. You know, that, that's so true. I mean, this happened on our street. You know, somebody just moved in, and uh, sure enough, Skip appears, Skip's full, you know, next to no time. Um, but, but what happens when Christ comes into your life? There are things that have to be ripped out, to use some of that language, right, that, that have to be removed. And sometimes the issues for the house are structural. It deals with things like your priorities, your time, or the way you spend your money. Uh, those are the kinds of things that happen, right? Christ, yes, when he comes, you know, don't diminish this. He soothes, he comforts, but he comes to rule. Um, and we, you know, a believer, at times you feel a little bit un uneasy about that, but at other times you just feel like, well, that's exactly what I want. I want him to come. I want to know that my decisions are right, that they're in keeping with God's will. That, that's really what I want. I want Christ to have that rich dwelling in me. Uh, and ultimately then what that does is that it establishes us in love, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Isn't this, isn't this what happens when, when, when Christ comes and, and in you, you feel this confirmation of the love of God in your heart? It, it's, like it, it's like it puts down a foundation in your life. My daughter picked some flowers yesterday and she brought them back home and, uh, and she put them in the ground. Um, and, and you and I know, though, though they're not gonna grow. <laughs> they're, they're just gonna wilt, right? Because there's no, there's no root that goes down. But, but when Christ comes in, it, it's like it roots you and, and it's like it puts down a foundation in your life and it, and it strengthens you for, for whatever God wants to work in you, whatever, um, um, whatever strengthening or structural change he wants to make in our lives. Galatians 2.20, uh, I think this goes along very well with what we've been thinking, just to, to kind of corroborate Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Right. It's that Christ dwelling in you, being strengthened by the Spirit. This is what Paul's praying for, that, that all of us would have that experience so that we would be rooted and grounded in love, and that leads to the next, the next aspect here. 
So we've looked at being strengthened by this inner renovation. Uh, secondly, strengthened for comprehension. Okay, this is verse 18. That we may be able to comprehend. All right, so, so again, it's using one of these words for strength. And here, it's a it's slightly different word uh, than some of the other words that he's used, but it's, it's the ability, to, it's, it's fully to be able to. So fully able to understand, right? Grasp. That's the idea of this comprehending to grasp or to take hold of. To take hold of what? Okay, so, so you're strengthening your inner person, right? And, and it's strength to comprehend, to fully be able to grasp what? Dimensions. Okay, here's what it says. So that you'll be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. And that's kind of where it leaves it that you would comprehend dimensions. Um, obviously, it follows on from this, and, and I, I will quickly go to this, um, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. But, but there, there, maybe it's worth giving a little bit of time to think about what, what could this be? Um, sometimes they say, well, Paul's talk a lot about power in this letter, so, so maybe it's power. Or Jews would often refer to wisdom. And so maybe it's talking about wisdom, or like we have the concept of, of love here. Some even, even submit, because this letter in many ways is about the ministry of the church, and we'll look a little bit more about that uh, in, in the next session, um, the, the ministry of the church. And so it's like it's comprehending the dimensions of the church. Because at the end of chapter 2, Paul, I mean, in chapter 2, Paul talks about this, this amazing thing that God is doing in the church. Um, but at the very end of that, he talks about how we're being built together as a temple, as a building for God by the Spirit, a place where God dwells. And so, and so some su submit that possibly it's like that, like the dimensions of the church. Fascinating to think about. But, but let's go with this concept of to know the love of Christ in understanding those dimensions. You think, about, you think about how God brings into the church people from every tongue and tribe and nation. I mean, think of that dimension. Think about that it happens, right, we have this toward the end of the, of the chapter here, in all generations, generation after generation, God is, is reaching people. And he's affecting, right, it's an effect that is um, in so many different areas of, of our life where you have all these dimensions that you would begin to comprehend the dimensions, we might say, of God's work. And of course, that encaps, right, that really does lead into the idea of God's, uh, the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. I mean, this is an odd thing to say, that you would comprehend that you would fully comprehend the love of Christ that passes knowledge. There's some way that you experience this that, that brings it home in your life where, you know, there are certain hymns maybe that capture it for you. One of the hymns that captures it for me is, Thy mercy, my God, is the theme of my song. And one of the lines in there, is, it talks about how my heart that wonders to feel its own hardness depart. That, that God's mercy so works in my heart that, that all this hardness all of a sudden melts away. I mean, I'm dealing with myself day by day. I'm wanting to discipline myself, to know the Lord, to love the Lord. And, and in a moment, the Lord himself just, just melts that hardness, that staleness in my spirit. To, to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. So being strengthened for this full comprehension, and you'll remember this reminds us very much of Romans 8.37 where it talks about how nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. There's that, there's that strong assurance. 
So, so strengthen for this by this inner renovation, strengthened for comprehension. Thirdly, strengthened for manifesting Christ's fullness, or we could say manifesting Christ's likeness. You know, when we read the Bible regularly, we can, we can go right over a statement like this. This statement that we have here in verse, verse 19, to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I mean, first he's saying that you would comprehend something that, that, that you can't understand, and now that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. We really should, we really should pause when we read that and say, wait a minute, what? That, that we would be filled with all the fullness of God? Um, what, do we, what do we mean by that? Let's think about a couple of the passages that use similar terminology. So John 1, you'll be familiar with this. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For from His fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. Christ there perfectly reveals, right? The, the fullness of deity, as Colossians says, dwells in him. Christ perfectly reveals the Father because he shares the same glory. So the fullness of God in Christ we have received. When you, when you see the Lord Jesus Christ, the fullness of God. Or Colossians 1.19, it pleased God that in him all fullness would dwell. Or Colossians 2.9, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2.10, that and you are made full in him. Uh, the idea there, uh, often it's translated, we are complete in him. And what Paul's dealing with in Colossians is all this empty philosophy that people are taken up with and that and that go and that they go after. But, but Paul's writing to them and saying, no, you are complete in, in Christ. It's his fullness uh, that, that you, you don't lack anything. Um, we, we don't follow the empty philosophy of an ephemeral, right? A passing society that promotes identity and happiness in finding yourself. God intends to flood the lives of men and women and all creation with his own love and power and richness. One author says he, he plans to flood your life with his fullness. Uh, I think that's a helpful way of thinking about that. Well, Ephesians 1, 23, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That, that again, toward the end of Ephesians 1, there's a prayer there. Paul prays three particular requests for the church, that they would know the hope of their calling, that they would know that they would understand the inheritance that they have among the saints, and that they would know God's power toward them. Uh, and you say, well, what is that power about? Well, he says it's the same power that raised up Christ from the dead, okay? And, and that, that, that's enough for us, but he goes on. And seated him in the heavenly places far above all power and principality and power, and every name that is named, right? So, so he just, he keeps exalting this. And then he, finally he comes to this and he says, the fullness of him who fills all in all, right? He, he who rules over everything communicates his divine graces to his body, the church, is what he's saying. He, he's communicating his divine graces to us. Or in Ephesians 4, 13, we'll come to that till we all grow up into the fullness of Christ. Listen to what um, Charles Bridges, he talks about the Christian ministry. And, and I know I've, I've demanded a lot from, from you uh, mentally here, but, but here, here's, here's, and this will demand a little bit more. Charles Bridges, he begins this book on the Christian ministry this way. The church is the mirror that reflects the whole effulgence of the divine character. It is the grand scene in which the perfections of Jehovah are displayed to the universe. 
the revelations made to the church, the successive grand events of her history, and above all, the manifestation of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ, furnish even to the heavenly intelligences fresh subjects of adoring contemplation. That the ministry of the church is to display the character of God, the glory of God. That, that here you are and you are to be, Paul prays that you would be strengthened, that Christ would dwell in your hearts, that you would be able to comprehend this love of Christ. It right, roots you and grounds you. That you would be filled with all the fullness of God, that, that Christ's character would be manifested through the church. Now, let's say someone said, I'm going to set up a football camp and uh, Gareth Bale is going to be the one who leads this uh, football camp. Do you call it a camp here like it's a, like a week long or a couple a summer long where, where someone goes and they learn skills? Right. Um, and Gareth Bale is going to lead this and, and there's a guarantee. Everybody who goes to this camp is going to come out playing like Gareth Bale. <laughs> Right, and you're just like, no, you know that that's a gimmick, right? I mean, that's a joke. Uh, you know, some of these guys, they they just not even they don't they're not the right size or proportion. They don't have the speed. They can't. They there's no way they could pay, play like Gareth Bale in his prime. But, but you know, this is what this is what God intends for you and me. That we would reflect the character of Jesus Christ that we would be made like him. And that, that this is what God is doing in the church throughout all ages for his own glory by the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what God is doing in you. I mean, that magnifies to me the ministry of the church, that this is where God is doing this. I mean, our individual times with the Lord are important, they're vital. But it's amazing to think that, that this is the thing that God in his wisdom uses to remake you in Christ's character. And Paul begins by praying, right? And, and he really sets, he sets us up, right? That, that, that he takes us up into the heavenly, he transforms, that you would be filled with all, that you would be totally transformed that you would be flooded with God's character. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you that this is your good plan and purpose, and we thank you that you revealed this to us. We pray that you would continue to do so, that you would open our eyes to see the means that you are using to remake us into the image of your Son. And we pray that even as we magnify the work of the church, that it would magnify the work of our Savior. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen.